Hi, I'm Dr. Seth Jenny, and let's cover limitations within empirical research, systematic research, academic research. Little roadmap to research. Um, this is the start of the road, um, the beginning, research idea. What is your research question? Identifying your variables. Uh, and really thinking about how, how you're going to measure those variables. What's the dependent variable, what you're measuring? What's the independent variable? If it's experimental, what are you manipula manipulating? Um, and then who's your sample? Who are you trying to uh, generalize uh, this study to? Um, who's, that, who's accessible? Who are the people that could actually be in your study? And um, what is the instrument that you're going to use or instruments that will help measure your variables. So we have internal validity is certainly going to relate to limitations of a study. Um, are you measuring what you intend to measure in the study is internal validity. External validity is synonymous with generalizability. How well will the results transfer from your study's results to outside of the study from your accessible population, your sample, to that target population? Uh, another key term, reliability, is um, if you were to repeat that study over again with the same sample, would you get consistent results? Another way to say it. If you need to pause the video and read it, go for it. And for you visual people, um, this is internal validity. Was the research done correctly? External validity, how well do the results generalize to outside of the study? Now, um, relating to reliability and validity, so we're talking about internal validity. Um, here's a key diagram right here, letter D. You can have very high reliability, but if it's not measuring what you intend to measure, which would be the bullseye, then it does no good. So look at the example down here. Uh, I actually have a scale that's about two pounds off. Um, if I step on it and get on it every day, guess what? I'm going to get, and I get back off and get back on again, it's always two pounds off. But it's not measuring what I intend to measure, which is my actual weight. So I want an accurate scale that every time I go on there is going to give me accurate score. That's so in other words, you can have high reliability, but not high validity. If you have high validity, you're always going to have high reliability. So here's some common threats to internal validity. I'm going to go through this briefly, and then I want to show you some research studies um, that I've performed and show you what a limitation section would look like. Um, sampling is always going to be highly dependent on the uh, limitations of a study. So what are the subject characteristics that are in your study? How were they selected? Was this um, a biased selection or was it um, you know, a convenient sample? But the more randomly you can select participants that have the characteristics you desire, the higher the validity will be in the study. Mortality, if you have participants dropping out of the study, um, they might have the same characteristics uh, and that can um, impact your results and, and bias your final sample. The location of where you are performing the study, the geographic location, the physical location can impact results, um, which is relating to that uh, generalizability. Is the instrument measuring what you intend to measure? Is it working properly? Are people, if for multiple measure study, if they are getting uh, better scores or increased scores simply because they're getting used to the protocols and the procedures in the actual test, then that is a threat to validity. You know, if I wanted somebody to do um, a vertical jump test and they've never done it before um, and I do it multiple times, well, they might get better at the end because they have had practice doing it. History. 
if I asked you what your opinions uh, are of um, people from the Middle East uh, pre-9-11 um, in the United States, you would certainly, um, some may have different opinions um, because of events that occurred. And so that's an example of a uh, threat to validity for history. Maturation, um, especially with looking at um, physical performance. If somebody is a freshman in high school and they have a track coach and then they look at their uh, running times and then they're a senior in high school and we say, hey, they got faster every year. That track coach must be a genius. Maybe, but it could just be because they're getting older, stronger, gaining more experience um, and they're maturing. Um, attitudes. Um, certainly, you're going to have um, threats to validity if people are in favor of what um, is being studied or maybe they're against. And so the, the way they behave and their attitudes toward what is being studied can impact things. There's also something called the Hawthorne effect. Um, so Hawthorne was a researcher that was looking at um, how differences in light within a warehouse impacted um, the warehouse workers' productivity. And um, what they found was it wasn't necessarily the amount of light that impacted productivity as much as when the researchers were there observing them, then they had higher product productivity than the, when the res compared to when the researchers were not there. And so simply being observed will also impact um, people's behavior and, and potentially what's being studied. And then implementing. Are the procedures um, consistent? Are they systematic? Uh, are there some types of threats uh, to validity based upon the way that the study is implemented? So those are common threats to validity. Uh, here's uh, relating to external validity, generalizability. So let's say that you're wanting to look at um, students enrolled in fifth grade in all of South Carolina schools. Well, you might not be able to sample all of the fifth graders in South Carolina, and let's say maybe you're looking at a reading intervention um, and how effective that is. Well, you might be able to sample all of the students in the Rock Hill School District, um, which is one town in South Carolina, uh, and it'd be much more manageable. And so uh, this would be um, the accessible population. This would be the target population. Now, certainly, Rock Hill is an urban area, so it may not gen the results may not generalize well to more rural areas of South Carolina. So anytime you're doing any type of sampling, you're going to have threats to um, external validity um, and uh, internal val validity as well. Here's another visual for some of you to see what's the sample. Um, these are the people that could actually be in your study, the accessible population. What are you trying to generalize it to um, for that target population? So let's take a look at uh, some studies and some of the limitations uh, listed within that. So here's a study I conducted um, entitled, To What Extent is a Highly Successful Men's NCA Division II Cross Country Coach Humanistic? So this is a case study with um, one coach which was a um, highly successful coach that had won um, over 20 plus national championships in cross country. Uh, the methods involved in-depth semi-structured qualitative interviews with the participant coach and three of his athletes. And there were eight overt naturalistic training session observations. So what that means is um, went and observed uh, training sessions, they knew I was there, and let's take a look at the limitations section. So I've scrolled down to um, the limitations in future research. Uh, a lot of times you'll see authors combine the two because certainly when you talk about what were the um, limitations of the study, then future studies can help improve upon these limitations and um, so here's some of the things that I listed here. A larger sample of coaches and athletes, as well as interviews with other stakeholders, assistant coaches, athletic directors, 
would have strengthened the results um, for generalizability of a larger sample and then involving other stakeholders to help with internal validity. Um, there were, as I said, there were eight training session observations across one point in time. However, next line here, extended observation period across several or all phases of training. So, you know, I wasn't able to follow the team and watch every single training session across an entire year. And so when I went and observed those eight sessions, um, it was uh, in one phase of training. So that may have impacted the coach's philosophy and his behavior based upon the phase of training. Maybe during uh, the week right before the national championships, the coach may act differently than um, during uh, summer training right before the school semester starts. The other thing that's noted here relating to generalizability is, uh, as it says, generalizability of the current studies results to all other coaches in specific coaching environments must be heated with caution. You know, certainly coaches have uh, different uh, levels of talent. They have um, a different administration above them that may be more controlling or less controlling. They may have access to certain um, equipment which may provide them with um, an advantage or lack of equipment. And so all of these things should be considered and an academic should mention those things to make sure the reader is aware of those. Here's another study um, which was a thesis that I was the, the chair of called Virtual and Authentic Tennis Similarities and Differences of Three Common Tennis Strokes. And so these were Division I tennis players um, that were video recorded um, swinging a racket in the forehand, the backhand, and um, a serve, both while playing Xbox Connect Sports, uh, Connect Sports Rivals video game, as well as out on the tennis court. And so the, the researcher here was looking at the differences between the two. So here is the paragraph which talks about the limitations of this study. It may not generalize well out to outside of NCAA Division I tennis players or beyond the specific motion-based video game, which i.e. the Connect Sports Rivals tennis um, video game for that. The other uh, part that this researcher note, uh, notes is using a larger sample may, have, may help uh, generalize the results more. And I think for this study, there were um, six females and about 12 males for, uh, for the sample size and so that um, increasing the sample size will all, always um, almost always help increase the generalizability or external validity of results. Here is a undergraduate honors thesis that I chaired um, entitled Sport Management Majors Perceived Motivators and Barriers to Participation in a College Sponsored International Experience. This was um, survey based research uh, looking at what, why do people um, study abroad or why don't uh, sport management majors study abroad? So here's a shot of the demographics table. And to give you an idea, um, there were 180 uh, participants who took this survey. And you can see the um, national representation of various university students across the uh, United States. So here is a uh, shot of the um, limitations section of this manuscript. Um, while the study included a sample of sport management majors larger than previous research, certainly a larger sample size would help increase the generalizability of results. You noticed in that last table, um, some of the universities were only represented by one or two uh, respondents. So that can all impact um, the uh, validity and the, the generalizability of results. Um, they also, this study was limited to students majoring in sport management. So certainly students who, uh, reasons why people do or don't want to study abroad specifically for sport management may be different for physical education majors. It might be different for psychology majors. It might be different for different types of, um, of students. 
And those are some example limitations within some of the research that I've done.